This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to Spotcast, Season 6, Episode 13. My name is Tim Mitchell. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there, kids! And we also have Jaime Lopez Jr. on the line in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? Itazuni. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jaime, is Seattle also on fire? Because we seem to have a lot of problems right now. <laughs> no, this has been one of the weird things. So as we're recording this, it is... Uh, hopefully towards the end of the East Coast wildfire stuff that went in, on in Canada. It hit uh, New York City famously with the Blade Runner 2049 memes <laughs> abounding. Um, Blame Canada. It's, yep. Yeah, it, it's a new thing for the East Coast, but we've been dealing with this on the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest for several years now. Um, Seattle tends to get hit with the pincer attack from Vancouver to the north and Portland or Sacramento, San Francisco-ish area from the south. And we've not so far hit that, which is uh, uh, amazing for us. Um, but uh, I, I don't wish the wildfires on anybody because it's it's really gross to, you know, to go outside and then smell campfire. And when you come in, your clothes and your hair and your body smells like campfire. You just got to go wash and, and shower up. Not healthy. Yeah, Pay attention been... to the air quality index. This was the first time that we have in Southern Ontario had the fires. They were carrying to New York City going south, but they were coming as far west as over near us. And, and yeah, we had the same issues with haze and smoke. And it did. It smelled like you were just walking around in a campfire for a, a week here. And it's, uh, as you say, and you think if you live in, a, in an area like uh, Washington State that is so forested that you might experience that but uh you just don't think about it in new york city or even in toronto but uh here we are well do you remember speaking of fact check um do you remember 1996 when you and i drove from i think Kelowna to kamloops across the Coquihalla highway and we watched the burning yes and we watched the burning of the forest yeah yes so, yeah so it's it's i guess it's like an annual tradition out there where harmony's harmony's living yeah, and I mean, obviously, fire is just a part of the natural cycle of of forests that it always ever has been thus. It's just that for the longest time, there was like a zero fire sort of plan where they tried to put out as many fires as possible. But what that does is build it into a giant tinderbox. So then it starts to go and it goes harder and it goes faster and it goes hotter and it becomes even harder to put out. So and you get more growth, which means it's going to burn longer. And yeah, it just becomes really chaotic. And then one of our one of our concert mates the other day was either you or one of them was saying that because all the fires are now in in the newly grown newly planted stuff where it's all like symmetrically laid yeah, out so it burns I think, up even better. Yeah, I think Heather had said that that it was uh, yeah that had said that it was because they were doing these like planned forests that are basically like replenishing naturally cut like cut down wood and like then done naturally in square up. grids. Yeah, yeah. Square grids, so yeah. it just basically cascades, uh, you know, right across these areas. Like fiery dominoes. Yeah, that, that's not a fun game. Nope. But nope. we digress. But and by the way, we're back. <laughs> we're back. We're back. Woo! Did everybody have a good uh, basketball play? I mean, spring. <laughs> <laughs> really? Wasn't there hockey in there too somewhere? I. Uh, you know what? I don't think I watched. Oh, I might have watched more, part of one game of hockey, but I watched almost every game of every series that I could of the basketball playoffs. It was amazing basketball playoffs. By the way, I, I couldn't resist. I went by the Hockey Hall of Fame just at, at, just like the day after the, the Kraken lost, but it was not, that wasn't why I did this, but I, I bought myself a Kraken t-shirt. So now I can represent the Seattle, the Spotcast and the Seattle Kraken. So. <laughs> I, I talked to a buddy of mine just after, uh, I think this was probably just as we were heading into the finals of the Stanley Cup finals. And uh, he's a diehard Philadelphia Flyers fan, or always was. I've been a Leafs fan from birth. And both of our teams have just been so inept for our entire lifetimes. I said, you know, we're probably mm -hmm. too late to get on the bandwagon with Vegas and Seattle. But I feel like... If the NHL expands again, I don't care where it is. We just got to jump yeah. on board and just start at the bottom. I mean, Vegas just won a cup in its sixth year of existence. Like, we really do have a better shot here. Yeah. So just for the for the point of that, when I was a kid, um, the 
the Buffalo Sabres started up. And mm. so we, my dad took me to a couple of Buffalo games and I bought myself a Buffalo Sabres, you know, um, jersey and I wore it for years. I took the crest off, crest off over a couple of years. But but I wore that. I love that jersey. I wore it all through, you know, university and stuff like that. And But I mean, so in terms of your your theory about jumping on the bandwagon and my jumping on the bandwagon of the, the Buffalo Sabres, how is that working out for me? Well, they've never won a Stanley Cup in their entire history, and they've been around as long as I have. So that's probably not a great example. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there for you, like in terms of like <laughs> you just jumping on, then being the bandwagon jumper on the next next team that comes along. Yeah, so. you know, I still feel like it's a better choice than being a Leafs fan. True. But by the way, welcome to the Accidental Hockey Podcast. Um, <laughs> that, that deep cut. To somebody. And oh, wait a minute, this is a Star Trek podcast. Yeah, so we should probably get to the headlines. Oh, we'll just loop that and, stuff uh, back around to the end of the episode. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. It's where it, fine where it is. Yeah. We'll confuse the, all the listeners and, you know, maybe we'll gain some new ones. Who knows? There you go. Well, let's do some headlines instead. Uh, I'm going to start the headlines with a bit of a bummer since we're, you know, talking about forest fires and leaf fandom uh let's talk about john romita senior so uh john romita senior passed away this week at the age of 93 uh definitely one of the most influential comic book artists of the 20th century uh you know just a huge legacy uh he had a hand in co-creating characters like wolverine the punisher mary jane watson uh he was sort of the second wave of marvel so everybody knows obviously stan lee and uh and Steve Ditko uh, co-created Spider-Man. John Romita John Romita Sr. was the artist who took over once Steve Ditko left the title. And he drew that book for uh, a decade or so after that and created tons of characters, huge iconic moments, absolutely uh, iconic uh, covers and art. Uh, he was just an absolute... Uh, yeah, just an absolute legend in his field and had a huge lasting legacy, inspired tons and tons of other people to become artists and uh, mentored a bunch of artists when he was working as uh, uh, sort of a chief creative officer type role at, uh, he was the art director at at uh, Marvel for a long time, so inspired a lot of other artists and uh yeah, just just an absolute icon. His son, John Romita Jr., also an artist, uh, very famously worked, uh, also drew Amazing Spider-Man and, and uh, a lot of other titles over the years. So obviously that, that legacy continues too. But uh, man, this guy, you know, I, I saw the outpouring. Uh, obviously, I'm connected to some people in the comics community and uh, everybody had something to say about just, you know, what what an absolute legend this guy was and and by all accounts also just a gentleman so uh yeah what a, what a loss but uh, what a life all right next up we got a little shuffling so i don't know that we've done any episodes since we started this uh this strike the writers guild of uh america is on strike and this has had a lot of uh, cascades across the stuff that we're fans of so there's a lot of things that have shut down, productions have shut down because they can't do it without writers, which is, yeah, I mean, good good play on their part. And in a lot of cases, what it's going to mean is things that we thought we were getting at certain times are going to get bumped. That's going to happen to some of the TV shows we love. It is starting to happen to some of the movies we love. There's a story this week about uh, Disney having to make a slew of changes because they just are not able to get a lot of things going the way they thought they would. And so let's go down the list here. So Avengers Kang Dynasty, which is supposed to be the first of two new Avengers movies, has moved from May 2nd, 2025 to May 1st, 2026. So that's a full year difference. Wow. And yeah. as a result mm -hmm. of that, Avengers Secret Wars, which was going to come out in May 2026, is coming now May 27th, 20, May 7th, 2027. So yeah, pushing those down the road by a full year. So that to me says we're not settling on this strike anytime soon. And then if you keep going down the list, we know that we're also going to get uh, some other changes. So we're going to get uh, Deadpool actually moving up on the calendar because they are filming that now. But that was actually an interesting side story. They're filming the third Deadpool movie now, but apparently there are restrictions on the filming. They have to go to the letter to the script. Because so like, yeah, so they can't rewrite anything. They right? can't rewrite anything, and that includes mm. Ryan Reynolds ad libbing. He's not allowed wow. to ad lib because that counts as oh, writing. Man. So 
what we imagine is probably one of the very big strengths in Ryan Reynolds' performances is going to be out the window. So I imagine what they're yeah. probably doing is doing a lot of the set piece stuff. And because he's wearing a mask, they will they will go back and re-record and dub and add things and whatever. They'll reshoot some scenes later on or they'll hold things back. But strange that they've done that. Anyways, uh, that movie has moved up and is going to come out next summer. It's going to come out on May the 3rd. But that means that Captain America Brave New World, the first movie with uh, with the, the Falcon character as Captain America, has now been pushed to July 26th of 2024. Thunderbolts is staying put, but it's moving from July 26th to December 20th, so another six-month push there. Um, and sorry, so Deadpool was supposed to come out in May, is now or was supposed to come out in 2025, is now coming out in November 2024. God, this is a long list. Blade, the reboot of the the uh, infamous character, is going from September 6th, 2024 to February 14th, 2025. That one's six months-ish. Fantastic Four, which was supposed to go out on February 14th of 2025, is now coming out May 2nd. And Avatar 3 has officially been delayed as well as part of this shuffling. It was supposed to come out uh, in December 2024, December 20th, 2024. It is now moving to December 19th, 2025. And of course, because you can't knock over one Avatar domino without knocking over a bunch of Avatar dominoes. That means Avatar 4 is going to shift from December 18th, 2026 to December 21st, 2029. Hmm. And Avatar 5 is going from December 22nd, 2028 to December 19th, 2031. So for those scoring ahead, the, the last planned Avatar movie is now coming out eight years from now. Yeah, wow. I mean, so my dementia will be full in full force by that time, so Which I don't even know if I'll be watching. Might yeah. make the movie better, I mean, really. <laughs> That's true. I mean, yeah. Um, the other thing that they mentioned in this uh, article is this is going to have an impact on lots of other properties. Uh, they are kicking uh, Star Wars movies down the road. The Star Wars movies, uh, there was an untitled Star Wars movie. Obviously, we don't know which one that is from the, the big slate they announced. The uh, one with no title. I mean, yeah, the, the first Star so, Wars had no title, if you remember correctly. There was supposed to be one coming out in December of 2025, and now that is moving to May of 2026. And, and then they've got another one coming out in December of 2026. So hold on to your songs mm. on that one. And then, yeah, they've they've also thrown a few other titles in here. The only ones that really kind of hit us. There's a few untitled Marvel movies that are getting kicked down the road, which, again, we, we already know there's so many other movies in the way. Uh, a new Alien movie is supposed to um, uh, move into August of 2024. And for Jaime, Moana, the live action Moana, uh, has actually moving up a week. It is now coming out June 27th, 2025. It was supposed to come out in June, July 2nd. So, yeah, that, well, that's, so a good, that's a good side of it. You know, that was a bright, bright that's, side. That's right? the bright side. That's the bright side. So, uh, yeah, I mean, our, I guess we're not really surprised by all these moves. It really seemed inevitable. I had heard in uh, on a podcast that I listened to that sort of talks inside Hollywood that it seems like everybody's kind of hunkering down for the summer, that there's no interest in really settling the discussion there on that front. For a while, it sounds like they're they're hoping to have this resolved by by the uh, fall, but that is going to continue to sort of be felt. The ripple effects are just going to be felt for quite a while. It means that some of the things that we love, like Star Trek, may not necessarily be coming quite as quickly as we'd like them to. I haven't seen anything about how this might impact the final season of Star Trek Discovery, which is supposed to come out next uh, winter, but... I kind of have to think it might, right? Like, it seems mm -hmm. unlikely that they are, unless they have already filmed a bunch of it, which is possible, I don't know how they could cram it all out, get all the CGI and everything else done, and get those episodes out in the time frame that they initially had. So I, I might be waiting for that shoe to drop as well. Hmm. You guys have yeah, any, any thoughts on the ongoing, uh, ongoing strike and, and or the moving of all these things? No, I mean it's it's unfortunate. I'm obviously I'm in support of the, the writer's strike, but you know it's unfortunate that things get delayed because of it. Not much we can do. Just don't give us any more reality TV programs. It's all. I oh, ask. I got some bad news for you on what's coming this fall. It's oh, really? going to be mm -hmm. a lot of reality TV. 
Well, we just catch up on the old uh, Disney movies we haven't watched in our lifetime. and Stay tuned stuff. for SpotCast Season 6, where we will talk about a lot of things that happened years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen six. it, it's new to you, right? That's, <laughs> That's the right. old That's NBC right. sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of some, some shuffling, we got some news this week from the CW on some of the programs that are being renewed or, in fact, not being renewed. Good news side, we got news that Superman and Lois is coming back for a fourth season, but it's a short season. They're only going to do 10 episodes, so mm-hmm. that immediately raises the question of are they going to try and wrap that up, or is this because of the writer's strike? So that's kind of up in the air. And the sort of womp womp of that was that we we're also seeing the cancellation of the Gotham Knights series on CW. They have already canceled it. Uh, the final two episodes are set to air. Uh, one one is next week, and the one is the week after. So that didn't really get a long life. I'm not terribly surprised. It seems like what the CW has been doing is clearing the decks so they can move all the DC content over to Max in the United States. So I, I guess I'm really not surprised that we've seen the end of Gotham Knights, even though I doubt they get really had a fighting chance. And that will leave Superman and Lois as the last standing. CW DC show, and now we know it's got a 10 episode season, which may well be its last. So, farewell, Arrow. Interesting. I, I, just, I just saw a, uh, a a trailer for Gotham Knights. I'm like, oh, that might be interesting. And then there you go. It's <laughs> gone. Before I even knew it was what it was, it's gone. Yeah. 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 What I mean, interesting do? concept, but um, it seemed like the writing is a bit on the wall for, for CW DC programming. Yeah. Cool. And the last thing that I had was the trailer for Foundation Season 2 has uh, has landed. And uh, mm-hmm. so we had a chance to have a little bit closer look at what is coming there. Um, and, you know, it, I, I had seen, obviously, a lot of uh, pieces about Foundation when it first came up. When the first season came out, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of people were disappointed because it, it obviously, I mean... What was the what was that they said about it, Tim? It was basically like the most unfilmable book of all time, and yet somehow they they tried to make it into a series. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and it, I mean, it doesn't resemble anything. I mean, parts of it remember, resemble what is in the books, but not a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I think in the end, and, it, and it that's was... what, that's my review of this trailer is like, what story is this based on? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, I like obviously they're trying to do justice to the amazing work that it is based on but it's awfully hard uh to do that because it was just so imaginative and so obviously the people who are hardcore fans don't like it and the people who are sort of casual fans are are a little more like what is happening here because there's just a lot happening here it spans huge pieces of time characters literally rise from the dead it's it's a lot um that being said the trailer looks pretty schnazzy like it the you know i will say i was really impressed with the production value of the first season i didn't love everything about it but man it looked fresh and original and different and unlike to any other sci-fi that's out there which i am always impressed by because so much sci-fi is derivative um so i'm definitely going to gonna watch season two and i you know i guess my my concern about foundation is just it's such a spanning story and i really do wonder are they gonna commit to keep making more seasons of this like are we gonna get the full story or is it just gonna peter out well like i said based on the number of books that are involved in the foundation and the robot series and uh and the galactic empire series they they could go on forever like with this with this these storylines because there's things to pick from right because i mean asimov as as a creative writer like he spawned a lot of what you know he's like all kinds of sci-fi has been based on his work right so it's interesting it's interesting you're right like it's it's a different kind of it's it's similar to stuff we've seen before but it's kind of different too like in that same sense right so so it's kind of unique. And speaking of which, I don't, we don't have the the Dune two trailer in here on our show today. Because, no, it's it true. Also that came, came out a few weeks time. back. So uh, just to wrap, Foundation Foundation's coming back on uh, July fourteenth, twenty twenty three. So we've got uh, we've got uh, about a month until yeah, yeah. Dune two Dune two trailer looked amazing. So yeah, I wonder if they'll show the Dune one again in IMAX so you can get the recap and then you know, or even do like the whole 
sit in your seat for six hours and, you know. Can we do a double feature with the David Lynch bat poop crazy one from the 80s? True, yeah, it would be <laughs> bat poop crazy. Yeah. Sting yeah. with, like, dyed red hair. It's awesome. I read, I actually read the audiobook, or read the book, um, finally finished it. I started reading it years and years ago, but I just got around to finishing it. Um, a couple of years ago, Mark on More Than Just Code is a huge Frank Herbert fan. And um, so he was like, oh, yeah, you got to read this thing. So I did. And I, to be honest with you, like I found the deserty part was like really long and dragging. So the fact that they were actually making it a compelling, exciting movie or Den, uh, Denny Villeneuve is doing that, it's it's a testament to his filmmaking craft, right? So, so good. Yeah. I mean, he's just such a beautiful uh, filmmaker. I mean, his his films are just... Even if you turned the sound off, which is one of the amazing parts of his films, too, they're just yeah, breathtaking. Yeah. He makes breathtaking movies. He really does. I mean, I get why some people don't, you know, don't like the pacing or some of the different issues that I've heard addressed about some of the movies he's done. However, man, they are a visual treat. Jaime, which, what are you most hyped for out of these things? Um, hmm. That's a really good question because I've been sort of going into stuff that's, uh, that's currently on so i haven't looked a whole lot at stuff coming up i haven't gotten into foundation so uh the season two trailer is kind of you know beyond me at the moment so i'm, I'm not sure not sure um feels like the the summertime sort of barely about to get kicked off feels like i'm uh more concentrating on uh strange new worlds and maybe a handful of other shows um uh, in this weird little gap we've got yeah, I mean, as, as summers go, we could definitely do worse. We've got Strange New Worlds This uh, we're obviously going to talk about in a few minutes, and then we've also got Secret Invasion coming soon, and now uh, we've got a timeline for Foundation. So there's, there's going to be some good sci-fi this summer. That's that's always nice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, well, I got a couple of things on here. Um, so I don't recall if either of you gentlemen have seen Station Eleven on Prime. I have not. I have, really, I, I have not. That's what was filmed here, though, right? Yeah, so so this is this story is from uh, TorontoLife dot com about every Ontario location that shows up in Station Eleven. Like parts of it are filmed. At, at, it's it's basically a dystopian, futuristic. You know, everything goes to hell kind of thing. Um, parts of it are are filmed at uh, the Ontario Science Center, which is kind of an interesting icon that may be going away. I hear, um, and that it was you know, a classic Ray Moriama architecture piece that was done in the 70s and, and our current prim premiere is talking about, you know, using I don't, building condos or something. But um, so uh, this may be the last, last sort of capturing of that. Pearson Airport, a whole bunch of like parks around Scarborough and um, different places that are that if you're it, it has a very Ontario feel to it, even though it's meant to be in the future. Right. So um, the first part when when the whole, you know, uh, world goes to heck, it's it's kind of like it's interesting because I think it's like a viral kind of thing that that takes people out, and and it came out right at the beginning of COVID, so it was really an interesting time to be, you know, thinking about everybody having to stay at home and stay inside, and you know, go and raid the grocery stores and with shopping carts and bring like five shopping carts of groceries to your house and hunker down, right? So really interesting story. Um, so that's cool. That's a link there on, in the show notes. And this this other one, the video that I have here, the armorer uh, who's played by Emily Swallows was actually walking around as the armorer at Fast Fan Expo in Toronto. And so this video she put out um, shows her walking around and talking to other, you know, posing with the other Mandalorians and talking to them all with, with her voice, like as the armorer, and nobody caught on. I think it's hilarious. And she was actually wearing the, the, the actual costume from the, from the show. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I watched that video. It's very funny. Did, there's been a few people that have done that over the years at, at Comic-Con and places like that, but it's never not hilarious to watch people being like, that's a really cool costume. She's like, yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, even even uh, Adam, I think Adam Savage, Adam Savage has done that a few times, dresses like, you know, alien, like the alien astronauts from the first thing. And he's, he's actually got a full Apollo 11 uniform because i remember the one that he, he talked about was like you, you have to put actual cooling systems in these these astronaut uniforms if you wear one because they're just incredibly suffocating and hot and whatever right so cool and i got a couple of stories here so we've been talking about netflix password uh test that they did but when as we left the show before our hiatus they had been testing this password uh sharing issue here in 
in Canada and a few other places, but the and our theory was, oh, look at all the people who are going to be mass exodus from Netflix. Boy, were we wrong. I got two articles here that say that the, the crackdown that's now going down in the United States, and Jaime, maybe you can comment on this, is actually le leading to a massive spike in subscriptions. So have you, have you heard about this or been affected by it at all, Jaime? I've not been affected, but I did hear about the line going up and to the right on subscriptions. So, yeah, interesting. And you guys laughed at me for investing in Netflix. Ha! It's a weird sort of thing to have happened because there isn't really a, a compelling singular item that's fresh and new on Netflix. So kind of surprised that people didn't drop. Well, didn't Black Mirror just come out or coming out? Yeah, it came out this Black week. Mirror would, would, yeah, Black Mirror would be a reason I would, I would go back to Netflix for. That's one of the shows I, I can't live without. But yeah, cool. All right. Well, I guess it's the main part of the show where we talk about something Star Trek related. And this time it is the dawn of season two of episode one of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And the episode is called The Broken Serpent. Why don't you dive in there, John? You got your notes ready? Yeah. So uh, ele elevator pitch for this one. Uh, while the captain's away, the Vulcan will play. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one. I was a little bit more uh, straightforward, uh, you know, like you would see the series listed on your streaming service. A distress signal from a former crewmate means that Spock must steal the Enterprise. Like, that's such an original th storyline for Star Trek 2, you know? Stealing a ship? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going rogue, and especially in Space Dock? Yeah. <laughs> who, who'd, who'd ever thought of that, right? Yeah, I, I didn't really make a, a pitch, but I guess I could say, have you got any more juice for another dance? <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good one, too. Well, that leads right into the, the best pew, 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 which was, uh, yeah, so this very memorable which, scene. Which was, have you got any more juice for another dance? <laughs> yeah, She literally exactly. says that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we got this crazy scene uh, in the middle of this episode where uh, Dr. Menga and Nurse Chapel. Uh, who, of course, are the lifesavers on the crew, uh, go like metal and juice up on speed and, and go ballistic on a bunch of Klingons. Yeah, yeah. So so the, I didn't I missed the green juice part or reference from the first series with the, the first season was. Do you guys recall that? Because she said she looks at it and she says, do you carry this with you always? And he says, yes. And yeah, I think they were supposed to be referring to the Klingon war. That would be my impression. Mm -hmm. Because I don't oh, recall it from juice? season one either, and I tend to remember those kinds of things. So I, my impression was that she was re referring to a time where they previously did this similar thing during the war. Because they were talking about the war and just how oh, awful it was. Oh, have these two known each other prior to being on Enterprise? Yes. Is that the idea? Yes, I think oh. that's the idea. But uh, it was definitely pretty memorable scene again you know little little yeah. jess bush uh, just you know wailing on all these giant uh, guys in, in klingon armor and stuff was was pretty cool and they even cut to the slow-mo so you can see the flying elbows and stuff although i did find that I, I i found myself a few times thinking well that's clearly a stunt double and and a couple times where i found myself thinking she didn't connect on that elbow and stuff but irrespective of that it was it was a pretty well choreographed pretty fun scene and again just to see these two people who are normally like the preservers of life just go nuts especially mbenga uh which was a great performance and to see him just sort of like yeah really going nuts in that scene was really interesting yeah it was a, an interesting contrast to have you know you know, first do no harm, second crack yeah. open heads. <laughs> well, it's funny because it comes right on the heels. Like one of the people they actually start, they have in the fight is somebody they just healed. It's pretty funny. So, yeah. So, and then the, the Easter egg, we've, you've got one Easter egg, but I've got a bunch of them. So oh, yeah, go for it. So I, I just had um, Spock's loot. My first Easter egg yeah. was the Alexander Courage theme right at the very beginning. Because mm -hmm. of course there's another Easter egg was the flyby. <laughs> of sp in space dock of the Enterprise. That's, Jaime, that's another Jaime you had to be excited by the flyby. <laughs> it, it worked out uh, pretty good. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, they, they definitely upped the budget, right? It was like not just, you know, moving left to right slowly. It was like, why don't we zip around this station like bees? Yeah. And the, yeah, it, what was it with the like the erratic flying around of like that? That doesn't seem to fit, right? You know? Um, but, but the other thing, I, I have the technical, the correct technical name. I just call it Spock's music thing because <laughs> I don't think it's called a loot. 
Oh, here's a picture of it. Uh... I mean, it's referred to online in, in countless places as Spock's loot. I'm sure there's a probable, an actual uh, ascribed Vulcan name for this thing. But uh, I think that's obviously picked up from the original series that uh, he, he at one point plays it. I love that, that it's given to him as music therapy by Mbenga after the uh, diagnosis that you're under stress. Uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah, and I thought so. And but and when uh, Nurse Chapel walks into the room, his heartbeat goes up. That's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, it's the it's the old tie to the uh, lie lie detector while somebody starts asking you the wrong questions, right? Yeah, and so I I put down fascinating as an Easter egg in a sense because because Mbega says it instead of uh, Spock. Um, yes, I've got stealing the Enterprises as a uh, as a, a another Easter egg sort yep. of trope, I guess. Fair, fair. And I've got Captain April because Admiral uh, Admiral April. Well, I know, but but the the April character was a pe- was in the books was Kirk's first captain, so Robert April. There you go. I don't know if it was on the Enterprise, but yeah, you know, because I have a book of Kirk's like first, you know, uh, lieutenant, whatever he was, and April was his captain. But it wasn't, yeah, a different looking guy, but yeah, same theory, right? That's just a fancy way of saying he wasn't black in the original series. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wasn't in the book. I mean, right. They had lots of black characters in the book, in the original series. Um, yeah, I would say it did, definitely did better than the average for that time, for sure. Yeah, uh, well, they had the... Because they, they did have a Dr. Mbanga, they had, yep. and they also had... Um, uh, there was an admiral, the guy that with, the, with the computer that... Um, what was it called? That, where they, they decide they don't need crewmen, they can just have a computer. Oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, sci- yeah. The scientist behind that was also African-American, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Michelle Nichols, who this episode was dedicated to. Yeah, that was that was nice. It was a, a nice moment to see that pop up. I'm glad they do still pay homage to the to the past, especially when you have the Ohura character living on in this series. That's got to be a well, and she's a big character in this character in this yeah, and especially in this episode, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess we could, we could call Morse code too uh, um, an Easter egg too, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and her starting to learn Klingon was pretty pretty interesting too. Weird Klingon dialects. Mm. Mm-hmm. In terms of near Easter eggs, if that's a category, like when uh, Carol Kane's character figures out, like, oh, this is a, a ploy. You're faking a warp core breach, but you know, I you know, I, I teach an entire course on this. I genuinely thought Spock was going to get kicked in the nuts. <laughs> And yeah. like Scrooge to style from uh, with, uh, <laughs> with Bill Murray and stuff, like she had yeah. sort of that vibe going on. Well, she because she was putting on that that uh, accent too, which was funny. Mm-hmm. A little callback. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I ju- just found online that it's also referred to as Spock's liar, L Y R E. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, I definitely found. Uh, I mean, I, I like Carol Kane. I think she's always been a, a good performer. But uh, it was it, she's laying on that thick accent, and yeah, she, I thought that scene where she sort of susses out very quickly uh, that this is all a ruse was was very well done. It could have been much cheesier, and actually, it was it was pretty funny. She's like she wasn't she wasn't like winking at the camera. It was it was actually done pretty well. And then, yeah, to have her basically say, you know, like, I, I just de- desperately trying to get out of working at Starfleet Academy. I've, I want to come with you. And then, uh, of course, over the course of the episode, deciding, hey, you guys need an engineer and I need to get the heck out of Starfleet Academy. And this is a good fit. Yeah, definitely. They refer to her. They, they make they call her out as being a Lanthanite. I, I took a look online. I didn't see that as a race that, that we've talked about before in Star Trek. Did, did that ring any bells for either of you? No, no, no I, I, just, I couldn't. I couldn't come up with anything in my mind, in memory. I couldn't find anything on the internet. I believe that's what Jonathan would call lazy writing. Well, no, no I mean, they, they, <laughs> could, they could put something new in. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, callbacks to everything. But I, I thought for sure it was a callback to something. Like the way they presented it um, seemed like a callback to something, and it, and, and it was not. Yeah, I thought it's funny though. But, I mean, obviously. You know, there's a million ways to get to the same place, right? That's that's why being a writer is such a great and important thing. But when you're when you're in a universe like Star Trek that has like a 60 year tail on it too, you know, it's hard not to do well. I'm from a, a race of immortal beings. 
but not that race of immortal beings. Because there's like how many we encountered over the course of Star Trek, like a dozen. And then, yeah. you know, oh, and I'm from a race that, you know, like they, they just they have to go back to these sort of, you know, ways of doing it. I guess I'm I'm glad in a way that they're not going to have all the tail and the baggage like it does kind of open up something new. So maybe that's a good thing. I guess we'll see as the, as the season plays out, but I do think it, it's good because it can open her up to like, yeah, new backstory, new something else we don't know about the Star Trek universe, which is opposed to just constantly mining Easter eggs, right? So so maybe that's a good thing. As this episode uh, plays out, so, you know, uh, the, the broad strokes, obviously, Pike at the beginning of the episode takes off because he's trying to help uh, undo the arrest of uh, Una for being an Illyrian. And that was another one where I kind of thought, I kind of thought it would tag back up at the end of the episode. Because he leaves at the beginning of the episode, says, I'll be back in a few days. And then the mission starts that Spock has to go and help try and rescue Laan and stop this insurrection and all this stuff that happens in this episode. I thought it would tag back up at the end of the episode. We'd see Pike again and we'd sort of learn a little more about who he was looking for and what he's going to try and do to to try and prove... Uh, Una's innocence or whatever the case he's trying to build, uh, but they didn't. And I was kind of a little ga- glad for it. One of the things I found a little disappointing about the beginning of last season of Lower Decks was they, they, they wrapped up the whole, uh, the whole captain being arrested for destroying the planet storyline in one episode. Now, it's, it was funny the way that they did it, where they basically did it off camera and that the, the, the heroes from Lower Decks had nothing to do with it. But... It, it was just sort of over very quickly, and then we were back into episode of the week. This is interesting, because the first season I found of this series to be quite episodic, and there was underlying threads. There was the sort of underlying Laan Gorn thing. There was the underlying Pike's mortality thing. There, there were these underlying stories, but really we were kind of going from episode to episode. This was the first time where, you know, yeah, like, it didn't... Um, yeah, it's it's kind of continuing this story, and it's going to last for a little bit longer. It's going to be either a front story or back story for, for at least two episodes, hopefully more. And, and that's not a bad thing, I don't think. What about the quotes? Have we gone through the quotes? I, nope. I had uh, a few here. So, you know, we had the one from, from the trailer for Spock's, you know, captain phrase of, I would like the ship to go now. <laughs> that was It was still funny in the moment. I knew it was coming, and it was still made me laugh out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It still works, still works. I have um, We Must Steal the Enterprise that really should be the TOS era motto <laughs> instead of that stuff about exploring strange new worlds. Like, this is this is the motto of the show. Yeah, don't tell the Admiral not to leave the keys lying around. Yeah, I had uh, I had a few that I liked. I, I liked um, Don't Start a Fight You Can't Win from, from Una at the beginning to Pike. I thought that was pretty uh, pretty good setup for a season, right? Uh, I liked when they were trying to convince Spock that he had to say something when he sits down and and, and sets the ship to to go to uh, to, to uh, warp speed. He says, "Must I have a thing?" I thought that just the way he sort of says it with like just a bit of disdain of like, "Do do I do I really have to do this?" I thought it was pretty good, and uh, and I liked Pelia, the the Carol Kane character when when. She's sort of talking to Spock at the end of the episode, and she she says, "Oh, you sweet unVulcan Vulcan," which you know, again, that's that's actually a beautiful way to summarize who Spock is, right? He is he's a very unVulcan Vulcan. He is human, and he does have these conflicted feelings. Particularly in this moment, now we see him expressing sadness. We see him expressing rage. He's clearly having issues with his human side, and so yeah, I thought that was really a. a a well-written piece for for that uh, for that part. I wanted to flag that the um, ep- the Klingon captain that shows up at the end, who's in the uh, in the Klingon battle yeah, cruiser, yeah. that guy was uh, his character's name was Duchok, and uh, was played by a guy from Newmarket named Andrew Jackson. So, get a, a nice uh, nice Klingon memorable Klingon captain role played by a, another local guy. So that's that's always good to see. Yeah, he did seem familiar. Would we have seen him in other shows before? Like he, he seems like he's played a lot of sort of small speaking roles on a lot of productions that happen up here in Canada. And so, okay. I mean, he's yeah. a working actor, and uh, yeah, great to see him. Uh, obviously, that's uh, that's not a bad you know little bit of screen time he got. So good for him. Cool. And my my one is the one I said at the beginning where she says airlock, unless you've got some more juice for another dance. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I loved uh, when they the two of them 
you know, jump into space because they know that the ship's about to be destroyed. And Mbenga sort of says, you know, yeah, don't worry, we've got a we've got a full minute, and the the helmet will transmit our coordinates. Don't worry, we'll pass out after fifteen seconds, so it won't be a problem. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I love that they they you know they lock onto them, they beam them on board, and Spock immediately starts performing CPR on uh, yeah uh, on Chapel, and Bang is just like lying on his side, his face is frozen, his eyes are wide open. I was like. Nobody else is going to take a stab at helping poor Mbenga. <laughs> <laughs> poor dude just lying there, frozen solid. But, yeah, that was pretty funny. I, I don't know if it was funny, but I, I, just, I thought because she was unconscious, that's why Spock went to her first, you know? Yeah. Besides, yeah. it was Spock. I mean, it was, it was her, like, you know. Yep. And, and of course... heart the, was racing. Yeah. Yes, it was. Um, which is understandable. <laughs> Jess Bush is beautiful. Um mm. This, of course, ends the episode, ends with this sort of dun-dun-dun moment where you think Spock is going to get in trouble with with Admiral April, and uh, he sort of lets him off with a slap on the wrist and says, this better not happen again. Yeah. But it also ends with him sitting there chatting with another Admiral saying, well, you know, we can't afford to have a war on two fronts. Thank goodness they didn't start a conflict with the Klingons. I thought maybe they were referring quickly for a moment there to the Romulans, thinking maybe, well, that's where we're going to go this season, and... No, it turns out that the big bad is is kind of what we encountered last season. Uh, the, and obviously, the 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 bad guys that killed poor uh, poor Hemner, the uh, the Gorn, are apparently headed for their space. And so, yeah, so that's getting pretty uh, interesting. Sort of foreshadowing for what might might come. I thought they were an interesting menace, although maybe a little too alien z. Although maybe it was just the way that they did that episode. It was kind of an homage to that kind of genre, but. Uh, I'll be curious to see what what open war with the Gorn looks like. Yeah, because they seem sort of like nasty, right? Well, and just uh, like, but isn't the Gorn the, the the green lizard dude that fights against James Kirk? It, it certainly is. And but when we saw the baby Gorn in that episode, where where um, Hemner gets gets killed, right? Hemmer, Hemmer, Hemmer. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Hemmer, Hemmer. Hemmer yeah, um, yeah. It, the one where he dies is is. Um, is the episode where they kind of the babies of that, but we really haven't seen the mature ones other than like bits and, and Lon's flashbacks and stuff like that. So yeah, it'd be really interesting to see how that, uh, how that plays out. And there's a lot of blood wine drunk in this show. Speaking of which, Oh, Spock being drunk on the blood wine was hilarious. And the line to April where he sort of says, could you mind speaking quieter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like as if they don't have control over the volume on, these fancy starships, right? Yeah, really. I um, I gotta admit, you know, I was thinking about this today after watching this this episode yesterday or last night. I found myself thinking, like, you know, we we always, you know, it's it's hard not to stack up your Star Trek series, right? You know, what do I like most? What what do I like best of the current stuff? And sort of ranking these things in your head. And you know, I I'm, I still have very very strong feelings for. Lower Decks. I, I do very much enjoy that series, and I'm like, really excited to have it coming back later this year. But this series is really creeping up the rankings for me. I like these characters. I like the vibe of it. It's just got such a real energy to it. I, I'm I'm really digging this series. Yeah, no, I, I, this this is one of the better. I mean, it's very pretty. Um, you know, it look it looks great. It, I mean, the storylines are good. They're not, you know. I find like like I gotta say like Discovery's gotten a little a little hard to take in the last couple of years, you know. I mean, it's got a lot of implausible writing too. I find right, but um, yeah, I think Picard. I mean, Picard was good, but but yeah, this is this is new because it's fresh and it's it. They do play on the tropes, but you know, um, there's there's not a lot of fan services. I mean, that's one thing that 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 Picard was riddled with. Season three was all fan servicey stuff, right? So still a great story, right? But uh, yeah, I find I find this this is a good show. The only my only concern about it is, of course, we're going to run into uh, run into the um, uh, the inevitable end of Pike, right? So yeah, I'm really curious to see how they resolve that because it is always looming, and we certainly are going to have to deal with that. And yet, Hanson Mount is just such a great captain, and he's so cool. Like he is he's quickly again climbing up the ranks of the captains. Like he's He's a great captain. He plays it so perfectly. The body language, just that square jawed confidence. Like he, he's really kind of killing it in that role. I mean, we, we talked about it when we were doing Discovery. Like he just, 
he just owns it in a way that is really interesting. And yeah, I mean, obviously that's going to be the sort of underlying tone as it was for the first season that we know what his fate is. But I really do wonder if they're going to find a way to give him some kind of, I mean, he gets a happy ending in the end in the original Star Trek series when they do the, the, the um, episode that, you know, he goes back to the planet and they give him the happy ending with the girl of his dreams and whatever. But yeah, it's still definitely um, going to be interesting to see how they tie it all together. Y- you'd hate to sort of see it and just, you know, and then he got catches on fire. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a kind of a buzzkill ending if they go with that. Yeah, it's not so good for the vibes when your hero, you know, bursts into flames. Yeah, I'm just uh, checking uh, a little bit of fact checking on um, Andrew Jackson. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he was in, he was in the 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 boys, a, a character named Love Sausage. I'll just leave that there for you to think about. Oh, I remember Love Sausage. I mean, he's big, <laughs> big. If you'll pardon the pun, character in the comic books too. Yeah. Okay. And he was also in Dark Matter, which is a show that got canceled that I really liked a lot. But yeah. Nice. Well, then never mind. Love Sausage is the top of this dude's IMDb for me. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That was a, There's no picture of, of that, him. That was a memorable sausage. character. Yeah. Cool. Did you all, uh, when it comes to the ships, it was really cool seeing the Klingon D7 in a modern oh, yeah, yeah. take. Uh, you know, seeing its pew pew pews prepare itself was kind of cool if you if you saw it preparing when um, Enterprise is chasing the the Crossfield class starship, which is the same class as the USS Discovery. Although oh, it's okay. not going to look exactly the same because that's a heavily modified uh, discovery, right? Like it's it's as close to uh, the same sort of analogy as like, you know, Back to the Future's DeLorean isn't really a, a stock standard DeLorean that you could have bought back then, right? It's got a lot of extra souped up stuff on it. Yeah, it uh, it was neat, especially just because of it, it, you know, it sort of rises from the ashes from that planet and, and then... Yeah, you see it sort of making that run for the uh, for the Klingon battlecruiser. That was, that was a good scene. It was good. I, I, right. I must say for, you know, some sci-fi we've seen, obviously there's there's a sliding scale of quality of, of you know, CGI and, and uh, special effects in, in all series across television. We just talked about foundation and the quality there. You know, if, if we're starting from a foundation of, you know, the CW stuff can be a little spotty uh, as far as the DC and, and some of that stuff. Like the quality of this stuff is pretty good. Like I, I really don't. I don't, I've never really seen anything there where I'm like, eh, it's pretty cheesy. Like as far as the the costume design, as far as the makeup, as far as the the CGI effects and stuff. Like the quality of this is is pretty darn good. Yeah, I really I like the Battle Cruiser. Like I think I told you guys when I was a kid, I wanted to get a Star Trek Enterprise, but I ended up getting the the Klingon Battle Cruiser, and I was a little disappointed. This one had just a little bit more. Uh, detail to it so it looked it looked even though it was like the same lame ship that 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 i got when as a kid it had it had more detail it would look better like you know what i mean like it it just sort of had a little bit more polish to it and you got to remember too that the original original series was was meant to be shown on a low-res television right so they didn't put a lot of effort into it right yeah but here it looked great yeah i found it believable so i have a, a star trek related question for jaime so I had noticed on the Star Trek social media feed today that they have now added avatars of the crew from Strange New Worlds for your avatars for the uh, the, the Paramount Plus app. Obviously, Tim and I aren't watching it there because uh, we, we get it through our, our uh, socialized sci-fi program here in Canada. So you've got Pike, you've got Una, you've got Spock, Uhura, you've got Chapel, you've got Mbenga. You've got uh, Erica, the Helms person. You've got uh, Laan, and you've got Hemmer. Who who is you? Who is your choice? If you're going to put one of those as your icon, who is your choice for for the icon for your Paramount Plus? Is it Pompadour Pike? Like, is it really epic? I haven't actually. Do they have photos? He does there? have. Yeah. He does have some pretty fancy looking salt and peppery, silvery hair in there. He, he does look good. And Benga actually looks pretty pretty cool too. He's got that like very sort of steely look and that big cool beard. Mm-hmm. Where are you seeing this? Uh, if you go to, uh, I'm looking on Instagram. I saw it earlier. I just I just oh, called okay. it back up on Instagram. If you go to the Star Trek on Paramount, so it's start at Star Trek on Plus on P Plus. Mm-hmm. Oh, They've got uh, all the different icons, and I I was I saw it earlier and thought, oh, I, I got to totally check it out because we don't get this option up here, which is unfortunate because uh, 
yeah, it's uh, they don't make those kinds of things available on Crave. But uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting that those dropped obviously this week and thought, oh, I wonder, I wonder of those nine characters, I wonder who speaks to Jaime as far as who who you'd want to see every time you log in to watch a Star Trek episode. Oh, they're not drawn up. They're just faces. Okay. Yeah. Some of it is dependent on the actual photos they chose. Like, I think the Pike one is, is okay, but of the photos they chose, I'm probably going with the Spock one. Yeah. I feel like you can, you can tell who it is pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty immediately at various sizes. But, uh, yeah, I might've gone with a Pike or an Mbenga one, uh, uh, otherwise if they had chosen maybe slightly different photos for the, the avatars. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. A couple of them are like, they've got that 30 mile stare and then some of them have got the, uh, like something sneaking up on them from the side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, Tim, you're looking at them. Which one do you like? Yeah, Chapel's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you really can't go wrong. Yeah, I'd probably go Spock too. Traditionalists, both of you. I love it. Well, I love the males. I mean, yeah, I mean, like Pike looks a little too stern for me. Mm. Yeah, you almost want him to have that little wry smile that he has on so many of the other uh, pictures and <laughs> yeah. posters and stuff where he's got that sort of like, yeah, I'm the captain. That's right. Oh, they got a picture here from the way to Eden where Spock is playing his... his it's, here it says loot. And this is from... from I don't know. Is, is, yeah, this is Star Trek on Plus. It must be what it's officially called. Woohoo! Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, no, loot. They're calling it. What do you know? My big what question you know? was, you know, the, the more serious one is what will Pike end up doing to help number one? Because he's... These two main characters, and certainly the main character of the show, is like written off from the first episode, which is kind of an interesting mm-hmm. way to start your season. But the less serious uh, big question I have is, you know, will Spock pull a Chris Pine and hit somebody with that loot? That's what I'm going to keep an eye out <laughs> for the rest of this season. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, should we move on to our uh, picks or what yeah. do you call this? The watch list. Our wa- the watch list. Yeah, the watch list. Okay. All right. Why did I put Scream 4, New Transformers, and Indie? Hmm. These were all things that are were coming at a certain point? or Well, yeah, I think I think the, I saw the trailer for Scream 4, and it looked interesting. I think that's probably why I put that on there. New Transformers, yeah, I don't know. I've changed my mind about that. Um, but, so I've got here, this is this is funny, and this is, this is right up Jonathan's alley. Um, James Corden, who's just left uh, Late Night TV, even though because of the writer's strike, they're rerunning his shows. He had his final episode. He's no longer a late night host. But part of what he did, he's been doing in the last seasons he's on the show is he has a lot of things where he does with with Tom Cruise. So he convinced Tom Cruise to join the cast of The Lion King on Broadway. So the two of them, you know, go through the whole motions of learning, uh, learning the characters and all that kind of stuff. And then they actually show as part of this this video tip video here. Uh, they play Pumbaa and um, who are the two characters? Simone, um, yeah. Simone and Pumbaa. Simone and Pumbaa. So that's who they end up playing, and and the crowd knows it's Tom Cruise and James Corden because yeah, because uh, it's it's pretty funny because like you really can't mask who they are, you know, the way those those uh, costumes work, right? Um, so it's it's pretty funny, uh, pretty funny episode. But uh, and I got to say, so the, my first pick here, I've got a couple, um, but I went and saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was I guess it was the fortieth anniversary. What is it? Is it the fortieth anniversary? And it's more than that uh, now. It, I think they were just reissuing because the new movie's coming out because uh, yeah, it came out so, in 80, right? So I have never, I've only ever, the first time I ever saw it was on VHS, when, one of your copies of VHS back in back in the day, because um, I never saw it when it came out in the theater. So I went and I went by myself to watch it in the theater. And I got to say, that movie holds up so well. And it's amazing. If you have never seen it on the big screen, I highly, highly recommend that you do that. Um, like, it was to me, it was like it was as good as Casablanca or any other any other movie. And as I was telling Jonathan the other day, that it, I'm just amazed at Steven Spielberg's ability to actually direct and put together uh, uh, a movie. I mean, like, and I, I'm still incredulous that George Lucas was even involved in writing that. And I can't believe he wrote the dialogue in that. But just some of the scenes that were so so good, like the scene where the the very first part where they're in the tomb and with the the uh, what do you call it? The monkey god, um, and the ball comes whipping down, um, and all the, the pitfalls that they have to go through to get through, get out of there. Uh, the scenes where he's he's t- in in the bar where they're fighting, you know, the the scene with the airplane with the with the Nazi big Nazi dude that he's fighting, that's really good. All the stuff with the you know the tomb uh, tomb raiding itself. Uh, the, the melty faces were, you know, you, we've probably seen those a thousand times, but, but even, even just a scene where, where the, you know, the, the, 
the magic is coming. I don't want to call it what to call it. The magic is coming out of the power arc. of God. The, wrath that, of that God. Is? Is wrath of God. I don't know, but it, it looked pretty cool. It looked pretty convincing, even though it had that sort of like you know mid eighties Ghostbustery kind of like vibe to it, right? From a special effects point of view, but. Yeah, I mean, a lot of practical effects in these movies, too, which which made them pretty cool. But yeah, it I got to say, if you have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, I highly recommend go see it in a the theater for sure. You will enjoy it. And uh, my last one here is I'm watching this on, I think it's on Apple TV. It's called Silo. Yep. It's it's kind of it's kind of um, it's sci fi, but it's basically about a future where um, inhabitants of Earth are now living in a big giant former bomb silo like it's huge and it's this big concrete um thing that goes all the way down and there's you know there's different classes there's people who are live at the top of the silo and engineers and stuff who live at the bottom and man- maintain the generators that generate electricity and keep the air moving and the the idea behind it is they're they're not allowed to have any um sort of relics they call them from from a previous from the age before they went into the into the silo and so there's there's a whole lot of mysteries about you know um, how the silo is being managed and run and stuff like that and and the fact that nobody can have and you know when you die you basically all of your stuff goes back into the pool and then it gets distributed to other people in the, in the silo kind of thing right so there's like there's there's a so there's a obviously there's people who are trying to figure out what is going on in the silo and what and why can't we go outside and all that kind of stuff so it's it's um it's really interesting I suspect my theory is that uh, the, whatever the problem was, nuclear or whatever, nuclear war, or whatever it was that destroyed the earth has, has, is over and it's green fields. And, you know, you know, like I'm sure the earth has survived, but the people inside the hilo, silo are being kept there by the people that run it. We don't know who the people who run it is until maybe the episode I just watched, but I'm not going to spoil it for you, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting sci-fi, uh, exercise and it stars, um, the lady who also plays the queen in Dune, um, which I'm drawing a blank on her name now. Julia. Isn't it Rebecca Ferguson's not her name? Yes, that's her, Rebecca Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah, she's and, um, both astonishingly yeah. beautiful and extremely talented. Yeah, yeah. She, 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 plays, she plays a character who ends up becoming the sheriff who you would think has a lot of power, but uh, turns out not so much. Yeah, like the worst thing you can say in in the silo is I want to go outside because they'll put you in a suit and shove you out the door, <laughs> hmm. right? Yeah, and those people don't come back, so we don't know what's going on outside. But that's how you get, that's the ultimate punch. That's like a death sentence to get sent outside, right? Hmm. Right. Okay. We're watching this one as well, so I, I can second that choice. Okay, cool, yeah. So what do you, what do you think? What's your theory about the uh, the show and things? Are you are you caught up on today's episode and everything? Or? Not caught up in today's, but it's going on all these different twists and turns. So not not quite sure. Also, I have not watched it yet, and I did send you a note the other day saying, "Hey, this looks good. Have you watched it?" And you said, "Yes, it's yeah. great. You should watch it." And I haven't yet, so yeah, that's on my yeah, to do yeah. list. That's it for me. Over to you, John. Yeah, I thought I would uh, circle back to some of the stuff that we had talked about uh, before uh, before we took our little break uh, during the last uh, month and a bit. Uh, so Star Wars Visions Season 2 dropped on Disney+. Plus. Uh, have either of you had a chance to see that, or both of you? I think I have two more episodes to go, yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw all of these. Uh, I finished them up this week. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting, and a, and a bit of a departure from the first season— Still the same concept. They basically give the Star Wars universe over to an animation studio and let them prepare a short, um, you know, 15 minutes-ish, 20 minutes-ish episode set pretty much anywhere in the timeline they want, featuring anything they want. I'm, I'm sure there must be some sort of vetting process, but it's it's pretty wide open. And I really liked what they did this season. In uh, The first season was very much focused on... Uh, anime and Japanese animation studios and it was beautiful and there were some really memorable episodes in there but this season they kind of diversified a little bit and went to other studios around the world and let them do that so we saw you know a bunch of different influences we saw you know we did see some some Japanese but we also saw some British we saw some Spanish we saw some uh you know French we saw you know lots of interesting I, I really thought the in, the episode that was uh Indian was really an interesting one um there was really a, a lot more sort of yeah just that diversity of the types of episodes 
it was a little incongruous just because they were quite different as far as animation styles and, and story types and stuff like that. It probably was not a good binge watch. I, I think I only watched, the most I watched at a time, yeah. I think was two or three episodes. Most of the time it was just sort of watch one, take a break, or watch two and take a break. It, it, I don't think you'd want to sit down and watch the whole thing. It would seem really herky-jerky. But individually, I thought it was really strong, and some of the animation was exquisite. And I can't say I loved every story. Some of them were, were a little more uh, just inaccessible. Like, they were, they're were they beautiful, but they really didn't have a lot of there there. But some of them were pretty, were pretty memorable and pretty interesting. I, I really enjoyed the... Uh, the episode that was done by the Arbin Studios, with that sort of claymation, Wallace and Gromit, chicken run kind of style. That was interesting. And again, that was the first one we've seen that was actually like it was meant to be humorous. It was funny. So that was a nice sort of departure. I thought that episode Bandits of Golak, which is the one that was clearly inspired by uh, Indian folklore and, and storytelling, was really, really interesting one, you know, that way. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, there there was definitely a lot more sort of variation and i really appreciated that i i hope they continue doing this i hope they continue telling more stories like this i like that it's not as encumbered by legacy that it's not as as beholden to a type of you know rigorous canon you you kind of just can do whatever and you can tell a story set in whatever time period and you kind of just you just need those familiar touchstones it can be a sort of talks about certain types of you know, characters, creatures, lightsabers, the Force, the Sith, the Jedi, but it kind of just becomes whatever from there. And I just thought that all of the studios did an incredible job on this one. So, yeah, I, I think it was, uh, I enjoyed it more than season one for sure. And I, and I hope they do more. Yeah, it was pretty neat. I did like the the Wallace and Gromit one. I liked the, um, the Indian one that you had mentioned. I liked the um, kind of more emotional, artistic one. The uh, the former Sith lady, um, that yeah, was pretty, that was a good one. Neat. Yeah, the yeah. colors and interpretation of stuff that was a little bit more out there conceptually, but it was really mm -hmm. beautiful and well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think it was really strong, and it really showed just that you don't have to tell the same story over and over again. You can really kind of go other places. I mean, this is what we kind of talked about when we talk about Star Star Wars is that. You know, please don't tell me the same story over and over again. Take me somewhere else. We love the worlds you've created. Now, now go play in those sandboxes, right? Um, okay. The next thing I wanted to talk about was Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Jaime, have you a chance to see uh, Across the Spider-Verse? I have not seen this one, no. Okay. Then, then we'll keep it super high level, which is to mm -hmm. say I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was exquisite. I think it's some of the most beautiful animation I've ever seen in my life. I think it is a freaking masterpiece. I think it is emotional and affecting and exciting and interesting and beautiful. And I, yeah, I, I, I went in thinking like, how could like the first one was such a great movie, especially to see on the large screen. How could they top that? And somehow they did. It was really, really good. Really, really, really good. I was, yeah, I, I, I want to see it again as soon as I can. It's so good. Uh, it it might be the best Spider-Man movie, bar none. Hmm. Even better than the first one? Yeah, I, I do think so, yeah. You don't have to get into the the origin of it all. I, I mean, I, I completely understand that you have to tell an origin story when you're introducing a new character, and that's the way that it rolls. And I thought the first one was a, a wonderfully told version of the, of the Spider-Man story. In this case, they didn't have to do that. It's almost like the Spider-Man 2 from the early 2000s, right? When you're not, when you don't have to start with that whole origin story, you can just tell a great story and you know the characters and you can just jump right in. And that's what they did here. And I just thought it was terrifically well done. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely is worth looking at. And I mean, I, I spent a lot of the time not, you know, not so much paying attention to the characters, but like, because I'm always looking at from an artist's point of view, how, how it's rendered. Um, you know, I, I, like I'm imagining in my head how they would put these various shots together because mm -hmm. uh, any one single frame is like, you know, multiple layers of, and knowing that they've all done it digitally, right? That's the other thing too, is like, if it's done conventionally, it's one thing, but, you know, because you could layer different effects and different painting styles and stuff like that. But the fact that this is all done in layers of digital paint, if you will. Um, is amazing. And even, even like overlaying, like just the way they, they shade the faces with, 
with uh, sort of half tones to to mimic you know comic book printing, right? Um, is is pretty amazing the way they do do that. So yeah, yeah, and even Good. the the way they animate characters relates to when and where they appeared too. So like some of them have these thick black inked edges because they're characters that were introduced in the nineties, and like they really, oh, really yeah? do just give you i mean i said it about the first movie and i think it stands true for this one it is the closest you've come to a living comic book it feels like a comic book come to life the art to me really spoke and this is just for my fellow comic nerds out there it spoke to me like a david mack illustration david mack is a a mixed martial a mixed martial artist a mixed media artist whose work is not just drawn but it's also overlaid with uh, images and you know he really takes like adds a lot of layers to his work that's what this felt like it at times it looked like it was it was you know like a watercolor painting at times it looked like it was yeah, it's an old fashioned collage. comic it's like book a collage. Yeah. very yeah. collage but but so elegantly and within the scenes the way they used lighting the way they used uh just the, the different types of animation related to the characters it was just a, a really truly a, a masterwork i mean really 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 well done yeah, I can't wait for the Vision Pro version to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get to be a spider person if that's the case? You, can just you, like... you get to be, you get to have you get to feel the paint on your face as it splashes by. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I again, I I can't endorse this one enough. It really was uh, as I'm, I'm. I was very happy that I managed to see the first one in the theater because um, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it, and I did, and I and I was so glad I did. Are they re-showing that one in theaters anywhere? Do you know? I had not seen anything about that, and maybe. Maybe looked, somewhere. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't see that anything about them bringing that. I wouldn't be surprised if next year. So they've already announced they're doing a, th- a third part. We knew that was coming. This was uh, billed as Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. Uh, um, I believe the next one, they've changed the title. So it's uh, Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse is, is what's coming mm-hmm. next year. But we, we already know we have less than a year to wait till the sequel for this one. Yeah, because it, it kind of... Well, I don't want to... No spoil spoilers. Me, but, yeah. No but, spoilers. Yeah, okay, all right. All right, all right, nothing, nothing. Didn't yeah. say anything. You just Wasn't say at all. it sets up well for another part. And well, that's a spoiler. <laughs> well, no, I mean it's it's clearly it's meant to be a trilogy and uh yeah, logically they're going to do that. Yeah. I'm really curious um as to where they go from here because this is it's already a monster. It's already made more money than the first one. It made more money in the first week than the first one did total. It is an absolute juggernaut. And we're talking about an animated movie here. Now, obviously, it hits a lot of touchstones. It's not just an animated movie, but it's Spider-Man. Obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of cross-cultural influence because uh, Miles Morales is, is uh, Puerto Rican as well as being uh, African-American. And so, you know, it's hitting on a lot of different areas there. But it's doing massive money. And you just have to think, like, there's no way they don't make a Miles Morales live-action trilogy at some point in the not distant future like that's just like printing money right i'd love it i'd love it because the whole point of this thing is that it's interconnected spider-men across across the spider-verse just like the first one i i love the idea that 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 could even extend as far as as all the characters that we know and and maybe even in the marvel universe that would be really neat oh you know so i mean you got one more i got i do have one last one yeah, sure. Yeah, so mine yeah. is uh, Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Amongst Thieves, which I saw on uh, Paramount Plus. It uh, it's legit. It's good. Um, yeah, I I you know was was still hesitant even after seeing the really good Rotten Tomato uh, scores and stuff. But it's it's nice. It's it's cheery. I thought it was doing really well in the theaters, though. Oh like, yeah, wasn't yeah. It? But like you know, let me let me tell you that Rotten Tomatoes for the uh, 2000 film Dungeons and Dragons are okay. 9% and 20% for critics Oof. and audience. Uh, they they move the average up quite a bit, uh, 90% and 93%, <laughs> and it's it's legit. It's fun. It's uh, it's it's pretty breezy. Um, I'm I'm somebody who has not played Dungeons and Dragons proper, but it has been so influential on on, on other games and media that I think if you kind of get the fantasy tropes, you'll you'll get it. But the way that they keep it fresh by sort of playing with sort of expectations and the mechanics of the sorts of things you can do in those games is like just really great. It was really fun to see them them do some some neat things there and see them uh, put in some 
some pretty good uh, fun acting work from a lot of the characters, a lot of the actors. Cool. Yeah, it has a good cast. That was something that definitely caught my eye. Yeah, it gets uh, pretty good ratings for that. It seems like people who have played Dungeons and Dragons proper are like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, here's that thing, here's that thing, and it doesn't really need you to to know the lore. I if, think if you've seen just about any fantasy films over the last you know fifty some years, uh, you'll you'll be fine. You'll you'll get it. Yeah. And so is, is it available anywhere here, John? Yet or it's available to for digital rental i think now and it's oh, okay. available for uh purchase on like cineplex store apple store stuff like that so you i think it's like six bucks to rent and 25 bucks to to purchase hopefully it'll drop at some point over the summer on uh, onto one of our socialized sci-fi channels uh so we'll we'll keep up with that um i just wanted to circle back quickly before you uh, jump in with yours tim on the the uh the money that we're talking about so <laughs> so into the Spider Verse, the original, the movie that came out uh, a number of years ago, made three hundred and eighty-four million dollars off of a ninety million dollar budget. This movie that uh, we're talking about, Across the Spider Verse, hundred million dollar budget, has already made four hundred and seventeen million dollars, and that's in a week, uh, or yeah, about, about a week and a half. To put perspective on that, Dungeons and Dragons, which was considered to be a, a modest success at the box office, $150 million budget has made $208 million, and it's out of the box office now. So, yeah, pretty pretty interesting economy of scale there, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's doing, doing real well in the returns there. Does it seem like it's set up to do more, Jaime? Yeah, I think... You know, without spoiling anything, I think they could continue with this cast. I could also see them doing the uh you know the character sheet re-roll and starting with a different jumanji yeah yeah um so we'll we'll see what they decide to do i think it's got a a pretty good um satisfying ending but with enough loose threads it's like okay i could see there being a sequel here yeah yeah i'll be curious to see if it if it hit well enough given that it has that great critical review and I, I think I, I, I'll be curious to know, um, obviously, there's a lot of back end on these things, like where they end up as far as, you know, streaming, as far as digital downloads and all that stuff, too. You know, it seems like it did respectively. It certainly made its money back plus more in the theater. I wonder if it's going to have enough uh, legs on the on those services that it, it drives the interest in more. Cool. All right. So the, I just want to say that last night I watched Shazam! The Fury of the Gods, which is the Shazam 2 movie. Um where we it picks up with the the kids who are all like he's Billy Batson's given this power to his whole family, and um, Helen Mirren and uh, Lucy Liu show up to uh, reclaim the staff that uh, if you, if you've seen this Shazam movie he breaks at the end of the movie um, by breaking the staff he releases uh, Fury of the Gods and so they they come back and try and. Uh, you know, payback for being uh, sent away. Um, so they go after the the uh, the gods that that basically made Shazam into what he is today, right? So, and there's a lot there's a lot of tie-ins with the sort of Marvel. So Justice Society, Jonathan versus Justice League, is that a real thing? Yeah. So the Justice Society was actually a uh, was created a long, long time ago in the 1940s and was the precursor to the justice league justice league didn't actually uh, didn't come around until the 1960s so yeah there was definitely those sort of ties that bind and they've always been sort of the you know older brother younger brother kind of you know little bit of a rivalry but also work together kind of deal throughout the comics there are some super cool characters in the justice society that are that are worthy before you go there the the um the, there's one joke in the middle of the movie where you know he he gets stalked by these these two characters who are you know big giant guy and the, and a small lady uh, looking for Billy Bat or looking for for Shazam and uh, they uh, or the character that Billy Bat's in place and um, or I mean becomes when he whatever he hasn't got a name yet in in the in the the movie part of that the, the plot but they they come up to him and they're like would you like to join the justice and he goes justice society or justice league yeah for sure and he, no problem and then then they finish the sentence and say no justice society he goes wait what yeah <laughs> you, you, do you guys have like cool people in the thing <laughs> did you watch did you watch the black adam movie no so black adam came out before this and black adam yeah, has okay. the justice society in it 
including oh, okay, Adam okay. Smasher and yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe, maybe I should go back and watch that. Yeah. No, but I just, you know, it was on last night. I was, it was, it was flipping through. I saw, I just saw, I can't remember if it was on Disney or what channel it Crave. was on, but it's on Crave. Oh no, it was on Crave. It's yeah. on Crave. Yeah. 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 Which is our age, which is Max here up in Canada. So Max so, yeah, Plus. I watched it and. Yeah, I watched it. It was it was pretty pretty good, pretty entertaining. I mean, like you know, um, I, I I gotta say the production value in this one is is really good. I mean, uh, there's lots of you know, uh, good pew pew and and uh, lots of you know dragon fire and and you know magic magic fire. I think Lucy Liu calls it at one point. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty it, like he it 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 is a knockdown drag him out to the end kind of deal. Yeah, so it's worth it's worthwhile watching. Yeah, I've I've had I've had both of those movies on my to do list for a while, but also every time I sit down to watch them, I'm like, there's probably got to be something better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was between shows because it was a Thursday night, and and I have a bunch of shows I watch on Friday and a bunch of shows I watch Tuesday and Wednesday, and yeah, there was nothing on. I didn't feel like uh, doing anything else. I, I could have done work, you know, like I could have done podcast producing, but eh, gotta would, relax sometimes. That folks. would be crazy, man. Yeah, you gotta relax sometimes. Alrighty. Uh, well, I guess that's it for another week. So, Jonathan, if people want to get in touch with you, where would they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK News or on YouTube at youtube.com slash at JPK. Cool. And Jaime, if people want to get in touch with you, where would they find you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair. All right. My name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A on the Twitter machine and the Mastodon machine. I'm still waiting for that blue sky invite. Come on, hit me up. <laughs> uh, but uh, you hit us all up. What the hell? Um, Just yeah, ask so podcasts. Time, We're good either way. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said, uh, many has before. We'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast Podcast. This is John Luke Picard. Shut up, Wesley. Sorry, say again. Just the tag. Gotcha. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash Spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, Spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. We just like to keep you. Hey, on your. I have a question. For you. I have a question. I have, I have a question for you, Jonathan. Mm. My my iPad just asked me a question. Do you know where you were five years ago today? Five years ago today. So that let's see. That would be 2018, uh, June 16th, 2018. Were we watching Star Wars? No. Okay. Then I don't know. You were sitting in George Stromalopoulos' living room oh, I watching did, him interview. I did see that earlier. Robert I saw the, the picture of the two of us with George popped up on my uh, on my on Facebook your photos? thing earlier today saying, oh. do you remember this? I was like, well, yeah, we were at George's house and then freaking Robert Plant was like eight feet away from us. Yeah. I had seen him the night before, too, because I went and watched. I got a, I bought a last minute ticket and went and watched him. Yep. Cool. Yeah, that was the only part missing from that. It was an interesting conversation, but uh, it was just hoping at some point he would just, you know, break into song. But alas. Nope. He just drank tea. Yep. <laughs> well, we're back. Hooray. We, we're we back. are back. This is us. Shake some rust off. Get get back in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Jaime, we're back at it. Money on the table. Mariners make the playoffs? Boy, it is, uh, it is still early enough in the season. They're, what? Five, five, is it five games back on the wild card? Mm-hmm. So not unreasonable. That's that's a doable number. Um, well, the good news is you're playing teams in the AL West over and over again, so that's got to be good for a lot of wins. Unfortunately for the Jays, you got to go up against the East over and over again, which is a bloodbath. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty weird sort of season so far. Um, 
you know, I didn't expect the Rangers to sort of come out of nowhere mm. and, and be top in the Astros. You know, the years where you don't have uh, uh, folks in certain slots, like it's, uh, it just feels like it's a, it's a tradition to have the Yankees and the Red Sox at the top of the wet, at the East, right? So to yeah, have them the, be the sort right of now scattershot. It's, yeah, Tampa and Baltimore are ahead of them. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, weird, weird stuff. So the weirdest one that I've seen is, and this has continued for like over a month now, is every single team in the American League East has a better record than every single team in the American League Central. <laughs> hmm. Kind of oh, gives you an how... idea where the power is all racked up. Yeah, 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 that's a weird one. Yeah, I, I've never seen anything like that, but uh, it's crazy to think like right now the Blue Jays are seven games over 500 and they're in fourth place and 10 games out. And they'd be Jeez. leading by a good distance if they were in the central. I never thought I'd want to lobby to be in a division with Cleveland and uh, and Minnesota and and Detroit, but I'm in now. I want I want to transfer to the central. <laughs> yeah, the the season so far for the Mariners has been a little weird. Where it's like they they kind of all all the 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 things that went right last year of like squeezing out those you know one win games. Like, all that karma has kicked back to be like, no, you're going to get blown out. You might blow some people out, but you're definitely going to get blown out. There are, like, no competitive games for the Mariners. It's mm. all sink or swim. And yeah. Sitting, Honestly, that's what know, it felt, felt like for the Jays. Of that. Yeah, if, it's, that's what the season's felt like for the Jays, too. It's it's either feast or famine. They, they either devour the other team. I think they put up a 20 spot earlier in the season. And then they've had games where they've just gotten absolutely clobbered. It's like, what what is happening? Yeah, yeah. That's it? That's all the hockey you guys can talk about? We didn't talk about hockey. We were talking baseball. Oh, whatever. <laughs> I laughed. Sports ball. I, I laughed this week, Jaime, at um, the, the Denver Nuggets, of course, won the, the NBA championship earlier this week. And uh, one of the players that won his first title with that team was Jeff Green. Jeff Green has played for 10 different teams in his career in the NBA. He's bounced around a lot. Good player, but just, yeah, kind of one of those moving parts. And he went to the parade that they had today, and he he got drafted into the league in 2006, and he went to the parade wearing his Seattle Sonics hat, because that's who drafted him. I was like, oh, that's his pretty... old, the old school one from like the 90s? The old school, well, yeah, I guess he was drafted in 2006, so he had the like the green, the, the big Sonics hat on today. I was like, yeah, good for you, like remembering where you came from. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool, man. No, I didn't see that because I didn't. I didn't watch the the parade stuff for the the Nuggets. But you know, kudos to them. It's the first time that they've done so as a franchise. Yeah, I, I definitely feel better about that one, considering they've been in the league for for almost fifty years. For them to to win their NBA championship, they certainly have a fan base that's that's earned it. I, I did not feel as good when the Las Vegas, whatever the hell they're called, Golden Knights, won the NHL championship this week. I was like. I think maybe I'm done. I think I think maybe I'm done with this as a sport. <laughs> this is just uh, like really, you know. I, I I think the thing that hurt the most was the day that they were lined up to clinch. They were walking through with the camera and they were like filming it. And I saw it on the highlights. Somebody was holding up a sign saying, "We've waited six years for this," and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna have to go kill myself now because that is the most depressing thing I've ever seen." Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not very long, right? It's a. Uh, uh... We waited one succession and, uh, you know, like half a discovery. <laughs> for... Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now it's, it's a new, a new uh, sort of timeline for the, uh, the Kraken, right? It's like, all right, we're in year two. So four more years. There you go. There's, there's hey, light at the end know, of the tunnel in, in four years. In year two, they were off to a great start. They knocked off the defending cup champions in the first round and made it to uh, a seventh game in round two. Jeez, they did better than the freaking Maple Leafs did this year, and they've been around since the 1920s. Yeah, the the pro tip is to, like, you know, have two guys on the puck and then on the other end have at least, you know, one person in front of the goalie. That seems to be the winning strategy from yeah. watching the cracking <laughs> games. When when they didn't follow, the, you know, the, these, uh, this secret technique, that's when things tended to fall apart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, you never really... Sometimes it's, you know, it really is... I think the thing, obviously, you know, Las Vegas did a good job of assembling a lot of talent and, and made some very shrewd moves. And, and I will say I've been impressed with the way that the Seattle uh, management has been building that team. I, I have found that I'm... Uh, I, I can't help but look at those teams and think like, yeah, there's something to be said for just the 
brand new culture, kind of starting from scratch, no baggage, you know, less bad contracts. You kind of kind of start from the beginning. Like, I almost want them to do a redraft for the entire league just to start fresh or something, you know? <laughs> like a like a league wide jubilee of some sort where we just cast off all the old debts and all the I like the it. Sins I like it. Done. Yeah. yeah. I think we just, you know, we burn it to the ground and see what, what happens the next one, you know? I saw a depressing post uh yesterday that basically said, you know, it's now seventy five days until we have another sport to talk about other than baseball. Because everything else is in its off season. And the NFL doesn't come back until August. I was like, ugh, this is the worst time of year as a sports fan. Unless you're a diehard baseball fan. But I mean, how many games can you really watch and enjoy in like June? It's weird because, you know, I guess technically every game counts because there'll be some teams on the outside looking in uh, for the playoffs that they, they just missed by a half game. Yeah. But it's so challenging when it's like, well, that was like, five multiverses ago yeah <laughs> and the team roster doesn't even look the same people got injured people got called up there were trades um like it, it's so weird that you know you, you could lose 10 in a row and it doesn't really matter in baseball again until towards the very end where i just feel like if you could sort of you know time jump to yeah. the last month of the season of like holy smokes what happened how did we get here <laughs> look at these these uh you know these pennant races going on i feel like basketball has that too there's definitely an old adage in sports. You can't win a championship in the first month of the season, but you sure can lose it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, there's definitely times where you're like, do you think that if you're now 10 games out of first place, like I, I get that baseball is a long season, but do you really think you're going to make up that against a good team? That's, that's a tall order. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. For sure. Yeah. I guess the other sport I am keeping up with, especially because I have a, a free coupon for, um, the MLS on mm. Apple TV Plus. So the Sounders, despite having a, just a terrible patch of, I don't know, eight to 10 games, are still hanging around second in the West. So hmm. they're still doing all right. And, you know, I'll, uh, I'll willingly, you know, sacrifice another coach, another head coach if we have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely uh, one of those things here in Toronto where they got Toronto FC. And there was this sort of momentum built over the course of time. They were, they were pretty terrible off the hop. And then they started to get it together. And they built and they built and they built. And they made it to a championship. And they lost uh, to Seattle. And then they made it to the final subsequent year. And they won a championship. And it was like, well, good for them. You know, I, I really, I don't, I don't love the product. But I, I respect that, obviously, it's the best you can do here in North America. And so good for them. But it feels like... That old joke, right? Where, you know, once you've been to the top of the mountain, anything else is, is second best, right? And it really does feel like since then, they, you know, they were competitive again and they've, you know, com had, you know, some successes and, you know, it's been a bit of a downstretch the last couple of years, but I still find like, if they're not competing for titles, I have a tough time getting interested again, which is really kind of, I don't know if that's m me and my issue, but it feels like it's across a lot of the fans that I know where just, once you've seen that team hoist a championship, you're like, well, now what, you know, maybe that's why it's better for, you know, I mean, teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs, maybe they'd be better to never win a title and just always have that hope that this is the year, at least people are coming back. This is the year. Right. All right. Th that's where one of those, uh, league-wide jubilees would help because it's really tough if you're a, a moribund franchise that has you know not even tasted the playoffs kind of thing you know, ignoring championships but like legitimately having it at least a chance to, to go for the championship that's really tough i think for for cities and fandoms to deal with yeah it's interesting because i saw a graphic this week when las vegas won the stanley cup they are the third new first time champion in the last i think four or five cups because washington had never won st louis had never won they had never uh, vegas had never won and so that's crossed three more teams off the have never franchises never won a stanley cup but there are still 10 teams of the existing 30 that have never won a stanley cup and some of those teams have been around for 50 years and you sort of put that in perspective and think like that's a long time especially with like never having won one but then you go into the, like the, the, the Chicago Cubs of it all. You go into the, 
into the Boston Red Sox. You know, the Red Sox, I think it was 80 plus years. The Cubs, I think, got to 100 years before they finally broke their their streak of, of a lack of success. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, people have lived, had children, aged and died, and their children have aged, had children and died over and over again, all being fans of these teams and never seeing them not once hoist a championship. I must admit that is part of my mentality when I think about sports nowadays. You know, as I'm getting closer to my 50s, I find myself thinking, I remember as a young person thinking like, well, you know, I've got a hopefully a, a all you know good fortune favoring me. I've got a long life ahead of me. I'm sure at some point I will see all my favorite teams, you know, have some success. But now as I get closer to my 50s, I'm thinking I don't know if that's the truth. I I could seriously live my entire life and never never see my favorite hockey team hoist a Stanley Cup, and that is a legitimate reality. The odds are one in 30 right now, and you know. It, yeah, could legit never happen. Bit of a depressing thing to come to after being a lifelong fan of something, being like, have I just wasted hundreds and hundreds of hours of my life? <laughs> maybe you have. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I should stick to being a Star Trek fan. Like, that's always time well spent. And in the end, the good guys win. True. I mean, occasionally Spock dies, but he always comes back. Yeah, sometimes in 40 minutes. <laughs> well, sometimes it's a couple of years, so, you know. Uh, okay, so last last sci-fi question before we go. Uh, are are any or all of us intending to see the Flash movie in the theater? Or is this a renter? I thought we were. Yeah. I thought we were. But I, I, what did I just read about him today? 71 million or something? Yeah, or they something. think over the four-day weekend it's going to make 70 million bucks, which is, again, pitiful compared to, uh, you know, some of the bigger avatars and Star Wars and, and Marvel and stuff like that. But considering mere months ago we were talking about the legal uh effects of the lead actor in this performance and the fact that they did a very interesting marketing campaign where they uh deliberately did not have Ezra Miller leading the marketing campaign for this the only time they appeared anywhere for for promotion was at the red carpet and I believe that that they were instructed not to say anything to anybody because I didn't even see any quotes or anything from them. So, yeah, it's it, it's such an interesting quandary. Like they marketed the hell out of this movie. It's been everywhere, like bus stop ads and commercials. I see every time I turn on a YouTube, everything, it's everywhere. On the marketing push must have cost them tens of millions of dollars. But uh I'll be curious to know if, you know, if it does actually pay off it's a really interesting way of approaching being like yeah we're not going to put our star out there at all it's no interviews no right no no nothing to support it from the person who's actually headlining it as a matter of fact plays two characters in the darn thing according to the trailers and yet yeah somehow this is uh still a success it's interesting it's really interesting i think i wasn't planning to see it in the theaters but uh that doesn't mean i won't uh i just wasn't up on the on the docket yeah, I, I think my perspective is I, the thing I'm not, I, do, I genuinely don't really care much about the Flash character, which is weird because I am a huge Flash comic book fan. Love the Flash. One of my favorite characters always has been. However, I don't generally care about this. And I particularly don't care about this because we already know that this is sort of the, the end of the DC uh, cinematic universe as we know it. We know that that's coming to an end because they're going to do this whole James Gunn reboot and everything. And apparently this is one of the sort of starting points of that it's michael keaton as batman that's i i i've waited so long to see a third michael keaton batman movie that's that's really what is the motivation i think it's the motivation for a lot of people is that nostalgia for you get to see michael keaton playing like a mature batman like that is the selling feature for me for sure yeah i think that's why he's been in the marketing so heavily yeah you think maybe they had to break him off a little extra bit to, to go to go and do all the promotional stuff for this? He was like, I thought I was just like a supporting part. Why am I like being thrust onto center stage? I mean, it'd be a good negotiating thing. They're like, hey, we want you to do this thing. It's like, so I noticed your star is probably not somebody you want on like Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> you know, if that comes back and uh, probably not a thing you want talking out there to the news. So uh I'm just going to leave the room, and when I come back, there should be big bags of money. (laughs) (laughs) And if you come back and those big bags are no longer there, then you'll know that I signed up. (laughs) I I think that's exactly how Hollywood negotiations go, actually. (laughs) 
Does does the bags actually have dollar signs on the outside? Because that is what I'm picturing in my mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like Scrooge McDuck or yes. the Monopoly guy. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I gotta admit, I'm I'm curious. I, I I can't even remember. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I think maybe Tim, the last time we went to go see a, a DC movie, might have been the first Shazam movie. That might be the last because I don't think did that come out before or after Justice League? I can't remember. Hang on, I'll tell you in a second. Um, letterbox. But yeah, it's it's been a long time since I think I've I've really felt any urge. And so, what year? What year did uh, what year did the last one come out? Like, oh, twenty twenty one, maybe? Maybe no, that's got to be earlier than that. Twenty nineteen? Twenty nineteen? Yeah, it's like before pandemic, right? Um, yeah, I, I got to admit that the, I've seen movies at home. That in retrospect, I thought would be good. Like the second Suicide Squad movie, I thought was really enjoyable. And, you know, again, James Gunn. Well, so okay, that makes sense. That checks well, out. Didn't you, didn't you see the uh, Didn't you see the the Harley Quinn movie in the theater? The birds, the Harley Quinn and the birds. Or, no, I saw that on TV. Yeah, I saw it on okay. uh, Crave. I think. Because didn't we go to like a concert or something just before COVID hit? Jane saw and Bob Strike Back. No, that's not a redo. Oh, it was it was Skywalker. I know, like, right before the pandemic hit, I went to see the Lumineers here in Toronto with my wife, and we went to go see the Beaches, which is a Toronto band. I'm just trying to think from a movie perspective, what we saw in that stretch. Well, Parasite was August, September, so that was the film festival. I'm just scrolling back through history here. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Spider-Man, no, that's DC, that's, that's not DC, that's Sony, right? Yeah, that's Sony Marvel, yeah. Far From Home. We saw Far From Home July 2019. Because I remember we saw was, we saw the Shazam movie because we remember we saw it on that weird uh, wraparound screen thing, right? Oh, yeah. Was that the one with the weird wall projection yeah, thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they, so like, it wrapped around the front because we were just like... Ew. Okay, Shazam, Shazam was t- April 2019. There you go. So, so, yeah, that's a while. Captain Marvel. When, was, when did the Wonder Woman one come out? Was that during Pandemic? That was a home yeah, premiere, right? Yeah, remember that. I think that one, yeah, exactly. I think that one came out, uh, it was one of those, Jaime, when he had the subsidized uh, content, because I think, Jaime, you saw it before we did, because it here in Canada, I think it came onto Apple TV after it came to free on, on Max, or HBO Max at that point. Yeah, yeah, just looking, you know, you know free included with your subscription stuff. Uh, 2021 was was a banner year for all the Warner Brothers films that would have been in theaters being on, you know, then HBO Max. And then, you know, Disney Plus had like every Pixar movie, um, you know, like the only thing I think I had to pay for was Black Widow. So it it's a little weird coming out of that era and sort of feeling entitled <laughs> to see these, you know, hundred million dollar movies for free on my subscription. What? Um, you want me to pay for that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? It's like, this popcorn is more expensive than my Paramount Plus subscription. Why is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I'm now finding another another DC movie around that time. Yeah, so there you go. That that would have been probably the last thing that... Uh, the last DC thing that when, we've seen. When, what was before... What would have been before that? Well, when did Justice League... We didn't see Justice League in the theater. I'm trying to think of what we saw no. before. That would have been probably maybe Superman, Batman, Batman versus well, Superman. But we saw the first... We saw the bad Justice League in the theater, didn't we? I don't remember. I don't think we did. I can't remember if we did or not. Maybe we did. Because was it, was the Ben Affleck character, that scene with, with him in the funny suit, was that in the, the redo? Or they had that sort of yellow, uh, sort of like a, like almost like a desert storm kind of yeah, vibe to I, it? Yeah, I remember. That's, yeah, that's the flashback scene during... Is that during Justice League or is that during Superman versus Batman? I can't remember which one. But either way, it's it's. Uh, but is, isn't he like? Uh, oh wow! I'm way back to 2010. This is not the good. the DC radar has been a little bit cold. I will say this is the first time in quite a while where I've you know whether or not I you know we go see it in the theater. I, it's something I do want. Okay, I'm gonna see. have to I'm do. I'm gonna do a search here. So give me a name of a movie you saw Justice League. You think right? Yeah. Okay. What do I get? I get Zach, Jack is Jack Snyder. No, 2017 was Justice League. Okay. The first one. Yeah. Right. So. Let me just click on it and see what I what I logged. I've seen this film twice. Will they include the Did different versions? Or? No, I guess I just saw it when it came out. And then there's then the the other one was 2021. Yeah. So that came out during the par- the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What other movie do you think we saw? 
Wonder, what is it, the Wonder Super, Woman Superman, ones Batman. The... We saw that. We definitely saw Wonder Woman the first one. That I remember seeing in the theater with, with you and I and, and Xavier because that was good. Although I thought the third act was good, not great. Superman versus Batman was 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Man of Steel was 2013. Well, it's been a long time since it was a DC movie of any quality. Well, as I say, I, I really enjoyed that second Suicide Squad. We, I just so, didn't see it in the theater. What was the one with uh, Aquaman and, and uh, was that Justice League? Aquaman and, and Wonder Woman and... But yeah, there was, that was the one. There was a Justice League with all of them in it. And then there was also the Aquaman okay. movie, but I didn't see that in the theater either. Neither did I, but the Wonder Woman one we saw, right? We, yeah, we saw the first Wonder Woman. I think we probably saw, I know we saw Man of Steel, and I, and I know we saw Superman versus Batman. Martha. The Wonder Woman was 2017. Patty Jenkins. Yeah, so I guess, I guess Shazam was the last movie we saw from them. So yeah, who it's, knew? It's definitely uh, DC movies have really kind of slipped off the radar. And, and again, there's been some, like I watched Aquaman here at, at home. I thought it was good. Again, not like amazing but there was certainly lots of lots of things to like about it and i thought that that the suicide squad movie was enjoyable even that harley quinn one it wasn't great but it was good it was certainly watchable and just sit down and do that i mean yeah I, I, frankly i think the best thing they've done in the last few years was the peacemaker series they did for max but uh and apparently as part of the whole re-expansion they're not doing another season of peacemaker but they're going to do an amanda waller series that's going to include all the characters from peacemaker so that's weird Anyway, I got to call it. Okay. All right. We've been going on for like many, many, two hours now. Well, feel free to cut out the uh, sports talk and uh, that'll cut <laughs> it back down to a uh, much, much faster runtime. Yeah. Um, how do I end this show here? Zoom. Okay. Bye. All right. Talk to you next Bye. week, guys. Bye. Bye. Okay. See you then. Yeah. Bye. Bye.